Hello, and welcome to the Aid Station. I'm Chris Robb, and it is my great pleasure to introduce today's special guest, who is none other than Phil Liggett, the voice of cycling. Putting today's show together has been somewhat of a marathon event itself. Phil is currently stranded on his game lodge on the Mozambique border in South Africa. The internet signal is so poor that it's taken us almost a week to put the show together. Day one, we couldn't connect on Zoom because the signal was so weak. Day two, we tried Skype. Day three, Phil and his amazing wife Trish decided that the best option would be to drive to the top of a hill, but the signal there wasn't strong enough. So whilst I was on WhatsApp to them, they drove to another hill. And along the way, they had to stop whilst a giraffe got out of the bumpy track they were driving along. And they were then escorted part of the way by a group of warthogs and impalas jumping across the track on the way. Lo and behold, the signal wasn't strong enough at the top of that hill. So we decided that the best option would be for Phil to do a recording on his front deck and send it to me. It took him over an hour to upload two minutes of video. So we then moved to plan C or what's that maybe D or E or maybe even F by that stage. And that was simply me sending Phil the questions and him doing an audio recording and us then editing them together with some wonderful pictures that he has shared with us. And that is an absolute testament to the man. I had the privilege of first working with Phil, I think nearly 13 years ago now on Cycle Singapore when he used to do our live commentary. And he is incredibly humble, incredibly easy to work with. And I'm so fortunate that Phil and his wife Trish have now become friends. But that's a measure of the man, always willing to go the extra mile, always happy to help, never precious about the situation that you put him in at an event. So we have this wonderful 15 minutes with some great insights from Phil. You're not gonna hear any further from me. I'm gonna hand over to that recording and video and just invite you to sit back, relax, and enjoy as I give you the next 15 minutes or so of Phil Liggett, the voice of cycling. Enjoy. Well, Chris, thanks for making such a big effort to find me because here I am locked down for the next three weeks. In total, it'll be five if we ever get out of here in my little bush house, which is right on the borders with Mozambique in South Africa. Well, it's, uh, it's been a long ride for me, quite literally, uh, since I took up my hobby, which became my work. And it all began for me about 1960 when I started cycle racing at the age of 17. And from then on, I developed into wanting to be a pro cyclist. That didn't quite work out. But along the road, I actually uh, was trained as a journalist uh, on the sport, basically a sports journalist, and I worked on the cycling magazine. So I've been lucky enough to develop my whole life from a hobby. And it's become, as I say, my whole life. I'm now basically a television commentator. I work largely for American television, in particular for NBC. I also work for Australian television networks and in the past has worked, have worked for all of the English speaking networks. I also run a company which I formed back in 1971 called P&P for Pat and Phil, my wife Pat, uh, Patricia, and the P&P Promotions Limited. And through the umbrella of that company is how I operate. Because of course, before I became solely a commentator, I used to organise uh, the Tour of Britain milk race. I did that for 22 years. I also qualified as an Olympic referee in cycling, so I've refereed the sport at the highest level. In other words, I became totally immersed in cycling. And that's why this year is very, very strange. Because so far, uh, since the month of January, I haven't seen a bike race. And the way things are going, I may not see one this year. Well, there we go, Chris. This has been a very strange April, to say the least, and now we've lost pictures, and that's because I'm in such a remote place as far as communications go here in South Africa. Just to get that piece of video to you, I had to drive on top of a hill, and uh, we were escorted all the way by a giraffe that refused to get out of the way of the car, and on the way back, 
six warthogs did the same. Uh, they seemed to understand that they were taking over now in lockdown and that uh, we were no longer in charge of the direction of this world. I suppose to a degree that sums up uh, COVID-19 really. I've never known an April like this in my life, of course. Professionally, I've been working since 1967 as a journalist and all of the months of April have been charged with me covering major events around the world, be they in Great Britain or the UK in general, or, or indeed uh, in Europe. And so for me, sitting here on the deck overlooking the Oliphant River, which runs out of South Africa uh, via Mozambique and into the Indian Ocean, life is very different. Uh, have I found out things about myself? I'm not so sure I have. I've learned to... Uh, I've always been pretty much a loner anyway. When I'm not on location working, I tend to be alone, uh, studying scripts, uh, studying statistics on the sport. Uh, the only difference here is, of course, I don't need to study any statistics because there's no darn races. Uh, and I've never known a year like this in my life, as I suspect many of our viewers come listeners uh, have either. So where am I going now? Well, I'm stuck here officially until the end of April and uh, hopefully then at the fourth attempt I'll be able to fly out in early May with my wife Trish, get back to the UK. Decision time for the Tour de France is mid-May. Uh, I feel it cannot possibly go on. The riders won't be ready. The, I don't believe the international calendar will ever be the same again and throughout my life I was once a vice president of the International Organizers Association based in Geneva uh, back in 1971 when I made my first visit there as an official uh, we had a calendar we fought tooth and nail to protect those dates for around the world for our own particular races as well as the big races like the Giro and the Tour of Spain the Welter and of course the Tour de France but now I'm not too sure that the calendar will be the same. People will look back at this year, see how it's gone. I think there'll be a lot of changes on the way. We might never know the calendar as it was. Obviously, the professional teams, which cost many millions of euros to put out, uh, they're struggling right now. The riders uh, are taking pay cuts. The sponsors, generous as they are, just cannot keep pouring money in and get no return. And so I think the sport will slip down a few rungs of the ladder and will have to start climbing their way back again. Who knows? The Tour de France may become a race for national teams in the short term uh, because there may not be the top sponsored teams who can afford to ride in the Tour de France. Uh, no, daily life as we know it uh, will change in the future. I have learned to do other things. I've learned to appreciate the nature. And I've noted here the animals because we're remote anyway, uh, but there are vehicles drive around on the reserve, uh, but they're not driving around. And the animals have moved much closer uh, to the people now. Uh, they, they're beginning to see us really as almost like they are, really. They might feel a little bit like we're intruders now because, uh, hey, this is their land and Mother Nature is reclaiming it. Uh, earlier in this year, I did speak uh, with an Aboriginal, an old elder in South Australia, and he came up and whispered in my ear. He said, you know, mother is upset, and the Aboriginals deal with the land and the ground, and that's how they make their life. And she said, he said, mother is very upset, and she is going to exact her revenge. So I think on that point, Chris, the world really is changing. Well, for me at the moment, uh, Chris, I guess the biggest challenge is survival, like it is for many people around the world. Yes, I'm in a very remote place. Uh, and frankly, we've little fear of catching the virus here because there's no cases recorded uh, within 40 or 50 kilometres of where we are and there's nobody allowed in uh, to where we are. But this is the second year in a row for me that I've faced a, a bit of a challenge um, of as you know, Paul Sherwin, my co-commentator, I brought into the sport after he completed his career as a professional cyclist, and that was back in the mid-80s, and we worked together as the longest commentating sports duo in any sport in the world. We sat alongside each other for 33 years, and on the 2nd of December 2018, Paul just simply didn't wake up and died of a heart attack of some sort. Heart failure was the official reason. So I, I had to face up to the new season of 2019 without him. 
Uh, yes, the guys who worked alongside me, Bob Rowell, Robin McEwen, super guys, talented commentators, no problems whatsoever. But I was looking to my left and I wasn't seeing Paul. As a commentator, I felt I did a real good job. Uh, but after the commentary was done, I was feeling pretty lonely. So that went with me all year last year. And now here we come, 2020, and we're facing up now to another big challenge, and that is this terrible disease which is wiping out people. So I, I don't know where we're going. For me, the first big challenge is to get home from here because three times now my flight has been cancelled because the South African government, I think, have acted extremely quickly and very wisely, have closed the doors to everybody. And because of that, uh, we've only had a few people die and only a couple of thousand contract the virus. So hats off to the government in that respect. But what it's done for me is left me in a remote land. My contracts, of course, are all gone down the Swanee anyway. So Paris Roubaix cancelled the Tour de France. As I speak, will make a decision in mid-May. I suspect if they go, they'll have to go in August. Whether they can go is another absolutely another question mark. Uh, the season for me, I think, will be obviously is highly disrupted, and it may it may not actually uh, go at all. So the challenge is to keep our hopes high, to realise where we where we've come in this situation now, to realise that what we have is is something we didn't realise or utilise properly. The pollution is a bonus now. Where is it? Because of no cars on the roads, people shut down. People see in mountains 200 kilometres away like the Himalayas that they never saw because of the pollution in India. The world is cleaning itself up in a strange way. And we've got to appreciate what we have now. So the challenge is for me to first of all get home, to look at uh, what will be about three months of huge amounts of mail, to pay all the bills, hope not too many people are chasing me, hope everybody understands. The sport itself has reshaped itself almost out of sight overnight. Now we've got Zwift and the likes, people racing against each other on there, even the pros. Um, I can't see the pros getting themselves into the sort of shape required to ride the Tour de France, even if it decides to go ahead. But what the big thing is for me is it's a challenge for everybody in this world. It's not a challenge for a couple of individuals. We've got to come together as a world, fight this disease, and above all, appreciate what we have. Well, talking of innovations, Chris, uh, I suppose I'm not unlike anybody else around the world, which is basically all those jobs we were never going to do because we were always too busy, but we weren't really, we're now doing. For example, I painted the lodge here. Um, we can't do the garden, like a lot of my friends said they are doing, because, uh, well, frankly, you get eaten. We have quite a few lime walking around uh, occasionally and plenty of elephant and buffalo. So it's best to stay in and paint the lodge. Um, I think basically what I've really been impressed with is the way that the the social media cycling websites have really come round uh, to mixing it, finding out what the pro bike riders are doing in lockdown. The pro bike riders themselves have told us their stories Virtually all of Europe cannot go for a bike ride, so they've all jumped on the uh, the likes of Swift and Trax, and they've got on with the job of trying to stay fit, just in case the season does surprisingly open. But now the pros are racing against the, shall we call them, amateur riders. Um, Rowan Dennis has won one of the big races. Good luck to him. Rowan is a tremendous talent. Uh, and also... Many people have tweeted me saying how much they enjoy my old commentaries, so I started to look at them myself. Well, quite frankly, I don't know where I got the words from. Uh, I don't script anything, as all my regulars know, uh, and I was quite impressed with some of the things I said over the years, and I've really enjoyed uh, looking back with the fans at, uh, at the events like the Tour de France, of course, Paris-Roubaix, and all the great races of the world. So that basically is what's been going on. And uh, I think it's brought to us all, though, a realisation of this world being very fragile. Yes, we are in the middle of a pandemic, but they've been here before, but they've never had this publicity because now social media takes care of all that. Everybody has an opinion and a lot of it is fake news, of course, which leads to a little bit of panic. 
Uh, so we've all got to learn now to live with each other and to help this world survive. And I hate to say it, uh, but people who are now creating large families have simply got to stop doing it. The world cannot take a general increase in population. So that's all about ed education, I think. Inspirations. Well, at my age, you don't have too many inspirations. Uh, but on the other hand, I've never Yay. lost interest in life, which is very important for me. And so I really do want to complete uh, my job as a commentator for a few more years to come. I want to inspire people to do great things. After all, my life began, as I said at the top of this programme, I turned my hobby into a job. And at the end of it, I still pinch myself at night, 55 years on, saying, how amazing is that? I remember when I got my first cheque from the BBC for a 30-second race report. And I said to Trish, um, can you believe the BBC have just paid me £15 to talk about cycling? Can you believe that? No, I think we're all going to learn a lot from this. We're also going to learn who our friends are, who are the people around us, those who've offered help, like the youngsters in the street knocking on the doors, which has happened to my friends. If anybody knocks on my door, I'll jump out my skin because I'll begin to ask the question, how on earth did you get past the lines? <laughs>